I'm Fraser Kane. You're listening to the audio edition of Universe Today. How many times have I been to space? Well, I lost count at, oh, none. So I and nearly every other human being on Earth can't compare with Story Musgrave, a legendary NASA astronaut who flew on the space shuttle six times, including leading the team that fixed the Hubble Space Telescope in 1993. He's the subject of a recent biography called Story, The Way of Water, and has a new CD called Cosmic Fireflies, which sets his space-inspired poetry to music. Story speaks to me from his home in Florida. Hi, Story. Welcome to Universe Today. Yeah, thanks, Fraser. Glad to be here. So we're just about two weeks away from uh, the next space shuttle going up to return to flight after the uh, the Columbia tragedy. Um, how would you feel if you were in the in the space shuttle? Now, have they settled on? Uh, I heard the date was between July thirteenth and the thirty first. Have they? Settled on yeah, that? it's a window. It's still a window, right? Oh, I think I'd, uh, I was never comfortable with a shuttle, of course. The risk is a lot higher than I ever wished to uh, tolerate, you know. I'm not a risk taker. I've survived in the aerospace world for 53 years, and I, I'm a uh, professional who wants to come back and do it again next year. So I've never been uh, uh, happy with the amount of risk that the shuttle is. But... <clears throat> I think uh, the current mission will probably be one of the safest uh, ever. I think they will have done uh, as much as they can, and they will have uh, looked after the details. And um, so I think the current, uh, this current launch will be as safe as any one they've ever done. What's the experience like of, of launching on board the shuttle? Pretty violent, I guess. I, I call it violent because... Uh, it's a lot of vibrations, a lot of noise, and uh, you're just hoping that butterfly will uh, just stick to that bullet, that's all. There's been a lot of controversy about uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, about about whether to continue the repairs or not, and you were you led the team for the, uh, the first repair mission. How do you feel about bringing Hubble back to service? Oh, I think we'll... Uh I think we'll go give it one more shot. I think we will go and service it one more time. Uh, it's not That's not over. That game is not over yet. And I expect we'll service it one more time. It may not be in the books now. What is on the books is don't preclude it. We've, they've been told not to preclude that possibility. But I think once we get uh, the shuttle flying again, certainly the public wants that done. There's nothing much more important to the public. The public doesn't understand space station. They don't know what's there. They don't know what we're doing. They don't see anything from it. So um, once we get the shuttle flying again and we've, you know, got an idea about um, the difficulties there of of ice or foam and uh, the thermal protection system and we get our confidence back, I think we'll get the confidence to take the shuttle somewhere other than space station. As you probably know, the only issue is it's not a matter of money or anything. The issue is when every time you fly the shuttle until it's flown out its lifetime, which people are talking 2010, should you take it to the space station every time such that you are you do have a lifeboat, you do have a means of inspection, possibly of repair and a place for the crew to hang out until rescue if there is a problem. So it gets down to the basic question, are you willing to take the risk to fly the shuttle anywhere other than the space station, such as Hubble? You cannot make it to the Hubble and make it to the space station. They're in different planes, and it takes too much too much fuel uh, to change planes. So you can't do both. If you go to Hubble, you can't make it to the station. How do you feel about the new uh, vision for space exploration? Uh, a vision of, of out there I am very, very happy with, to go beyond Earth orbit. Space station was a terrible strategic error. Uh, we've not had a solid vision, of course, since the moon and Skylab. 
Skylab, our first space station, I was involved in developing and a backup crew member on the first one in 1973. Uh, that, the Apollo and the Skylab programs uh, had a vision. We knew where we were going, what we wanted to do, and it was exploration and discovery. We kind of lost the way from that point on in terms of staying in touch with the public who wants exploration and discovery, wants a little further out there. The Voyagers, of course, were fantastic successes, and this year <clears throat> they plan to pull the plug on them uh, just for money purposes when, in fact, the Voyagers are defining the edge of the solar system. So, but a new vision, a new vision at least, has words back to the moon and to Mars, so it's a little further out. How that unfolds, of course, is no one knows where the resources will come from and when we transition from uh, the current efforts we're doing. Until we get out of the current efforts, there'll be no money for uh, the further out explorations. <clears throat> but they also have to be done right. We cannot leap off and go. We have to lead with the robots. They have to go first, establish habitats and science centers. They need to go first. So then you can do a space optimally, you know, low-cost, reliable space if you lead with the robots. We have to do that this time. And, and do you feel that the U.S. and it may be the world in, in general are, are more interested in space and space exploration than, than maybe the government gives it credit? Oh, yeah. The people are. The people are usually interested in exploration and discovery. They're very interested in what kind of universe they got, what's their place in it. They're interested in the big questions. So that's what they're after. That's why I'm excited about space, not the spinoffs, not the technical spinoffs, not just the technology. They're interested in discovering their universe. They're, they want some answers to their existential questions. What's life mean here? What's the meaning of hope of what I'm doing here? And so things like Hubble tend to bridge those gaps between cosmology and theology, philosophy and astronomy. And that's why Hubble has always meant so much to people. So that's why that kind of exploration and discovery, you can do it in a microscope as well. You can do it with really cutting-edge science. As all those things are exciting to people. But space, uh, the going out beyond Earth, whether you do it with um, telescopes, you know, or, or other robots, or eventually humans, uh, and that's why people are excited about space. Uh, astronomy and, and the search for life on Mars and so on, has a chance to, to really put us in perspective here in, in the universe. Yeah, you'll never know. You can't know what happened here until you find one other. Of course, contact, you know, is with linear time and linear distances is going to be very, very difficult. But there's no way we will understand how creation, evolution, and intelligent beings and the information age and all that came to pass on this planet, we'll never understand that until we see how that happened on some other body. And so that is critical, very critical. We're dealing, as scientists, we're dealing with a sample of one, how it happened and why it happened. A sample of one. Usually you can't make conclusions from one. And so all those things are uh, are highly important. But we can we can take small steps before we make contact. Now, you can make steps in that the and that the human species, uh, the human species accepts the other long before you get the proof, the contact. That's part of our growth. It's part of our Copernican growth. Do we accept other, other living creatures and accept other intelligent creatures? See, it's all part. That's all part of the Copernican thing that the universe does not go around the Earth. It's part of the Darwinian thing about evolution. It's part of Freud and his subconscious, which is very important to to human behavior, even though you can't get at it. It's Einstein's relativity, Heisenberg's uh, you know, uncertainty, and those kind of things, they are part of our species' growth. And so I think long before we get to physical proof of it, that part of our growth will be universal among the species' acceptance of the other. So do you think that uh, that humans are sort of emotionally ready to uh, meet contact with another alien species? I uh, know they're not. Uh, they're not, and, and it won't happen, see. Anything that is so advanced 